somewhere else. But um, we are looking at just understanding the, the trainees. Once they come in, we assess them in terms of you know where they're from, level of education, who has math, English, you know, um, what they really want to do. Because, you know, you do find yourself sometimes where, you know, people want to be carpenters, but the, the labor market information is not suggesting that you should be a carpenter at this time. So we, we, we try to understand, um, if, you know, what is it that they are looking for, what is it that they would like, and some of the challenges um, around them. You know, we have training that come in with certain level of addiction. You know, um, some plants are now kind of quasi legal, so you find that they think they can smoke as much of it as possible. So we, 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 get, we, we get that assessment in terms of who is it that we're dealing with. Then we engage the trainers and we, we provide this information to the trainers um, to kind of um, to say to them, this is who, this is the person or persons that will be coming to you. So they themselves can start to make preparation for the, the young persons that is coming to them for training. We then have what we consider um, it's a kind of pre-training workshop. It's it's a it's a we, we bring together the trainers and the trainees, and we are a part of that engagement. And you know, um, the, the, the workshop look at a number of different things. Our, our orientation, it looks at um, change management, talking to them about managing change, and a um, um, certain level of expectation, because as I go further in the presentation, there's, there's an important thing that May, makes that, that kind of engagement extremely important because unlike you know, um, some programs, none of our trainees actually leave at the end of the week of a training with any kind of money. There is no stipend that is provided to them. So that initial engagement in terms of what we will provide, what the trainers can do is, is extremely important. And in fact, we actually, we try to sell them the training. Okay, we know what you want to do, but here are our trainers, and, and the, the trainers, the service providers will actually tell them how this type of training, what can you do with it, what are the opportunities available, so that they select at that point the things that they would like to be involved with. We do some early job readiness assessment. We have a particular tool that was designed to do that, which is, is, is basically, we were looking at can a young person actually represent themselves before, before, some, before someone else? Um, how do they dress? So how do they carry themselves? How do they speak? Just, um, if I could just look. Look at one other thing there. In terms of the post-training support, I have a very hard task master here, so I have to move fast. In terms of the post-training support, what we provide for a lot of our training, we, we accept the fact that we will not be able to place every one of them that we train. So we do not enter the engagement with false expectation that if we have 10 trainees then will be able um, to facilitate jobs for all 10 of them. So we provide starter kits for, for the trainee. So like Madam CEO from Manpower is here, her people will get, like the landscapers get weed walkers and um, um, cordless um, air trimmers. Um, we have um, another partner here, Alicia from Internet Income, they get their, their note um, notebooks, and so, so they can do their, their online entrepreneurial business um, with the kinds of tools that, you know, they'll be. We also provide as well some soft support because once we do the job readiness assessment, there are things that we pick up. We may pick up things about interviewing skills, things about deportment, hygiene, and so forth. So there's an intervention, a soft intervention that is geared that actually addressing, turning some of the, some of the no's and the, and the assessment tools to yeses. The numbers that we're looking at now, um, as I said, JSIF, uh, JSIF has been involved in training quite a bit. We did a cycle one, which we learned 
quite a bit from for Circle Ward. We had we we served about 300, um, just over 300 young people. I like to look at the the numbers for Circle Two. You know where we have actually refined uh, refined some of the the tools that we had for Circle One. We currently have about 450 young um, young persons in in training. Um, I, I tell you, we have a over 90 percent attendance rate, despite the fact that we don't provide stipend. What we provide for them is pretty much we provide transportation to pick you up at set locations in your community, and they will wait for you for a few minutes. So you need to be there at seven something, or uh, whenever the time is, and we provide a meal for you once you're at the training. We provide the we provide the opportunity to, to actually participate in the training and you need to have the motivation um, to carry yourself um, through that training. Okay, um, here, are some, uh, here are some assumptions and I'm just going to go through one or two of them before I ask um, one of our partners to just come and, and, and speak to, to the partnership itself. These are just some of the assumptions that, you know, in that under in the, the JCF approach, you know, it matters how we engage um, the young people. Um, their time is important as well. There's an opportunity to cost the training. They could be on the corner hustling, doing the stuff that they do. So they are actually investing. We do not see them as beneficiaries only. We see them as stakeholders as well in the, in the training. And the, the soft skills, are just as, in, as important as the scale. At this time, I'm going to ask Alisa from Internet Income, the CEO, to actually just speak to the partnership on what we have been doing with them. And um, I'm going to pounce on Madam CEO Inchcliffe from Manpower Maintenance Services. She wasn't expecting this to actually also speak to that partnership as well. These are two of my favorite people, so they will not say no. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alicia Little from Internet Income Jamaica, and what we teach our participants how to do is to earn income online. We have skills development training where we teach them website building and transcription, which is taking an audio and a video and typing it up, and graphic design. Now, for our classes in Montego Bay and Kingston, our top money-making skills are transcription. They're making a lot of money doing transcription. Also, legitimate phone calls. So companies will hire our students to make phone calls for them. And I will say that the Montego Bay group is leading in making money from making phone calls from home. We also have legitimate phone calls. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, uh, very, very often companies will just hire our students and say, here's 30 of our clients, call them and make sure they got the book we shipped to them. Um, oddly enough, one of our also money-making things that they do is giving relationship advice. That's a top-selling offer on the internet. Uh, their clients are coming from the USA, UK, Canada, Australia, and Asia, in that order. And the platforms that we're putting them on are Fiverr.com, Upwork.com, and Microworkers.com. They are earning in U.S. dollars globally and bringing it into, their, into Jamaica, bringing this U.S. dollars into Jamaica and spending it within their communities through the Payoneer card. So they get a card called the Payoneer card that's an ATM debit card, but it's also a master card. So they have the ability to purchase and buy online anywhere in the world with this master card. They can also take money out in an ATM machine in U.S. or Jamaican dollars. So I'd just like to say thank you to the Jamaica Social Investment Fund for this alternative livelihood program that you have allowed us to partner with you on. We have 60 participants, 30 in Montego Bay, 30 in Jamaica, who now have their own online businesses earning U.S. dollars. Thank you very much. Mr. Bennett didn't hear the um, thing from the Bible, you must not lay hands suddenly on a person. Um, the partnership between the Institute for Workforce Education and Development and JSIF is one that is invaluable to communities. Um, I walk with my article where we were bigged up by the World Bank for the results of the um, partnership. Um, because of the way manpower is structured, um, in that we can employ, we train, and we place, while they are in training, screened and sent to us, um, and during the time of orientation, 
they may find that they want to do something other than what they thought they could do, and we send them in the direction where they can start earning. For example, because we have such a large clientele, I can place them very readily in jobs while they are getting their um, training. And right now, from the groups that have been sent to us, because we cover, there's an office in King, training center in Kingston, Mandeville, Montego Bay. We can cover all the communities from which um, JCF um, pull their um, trainees. From day one in training, as I said, I start placing them. Some of you who go to Price Mart, many of the people you are seeing in there picking up cards, so on, cashiers and so on, may very well be coming from a training program. For Manpower, I recently hired three supervisors from the group. You'd be surprised to know the gems that are in those communities who are just looking to be discovered. And the base of the pyramid, that's where manpower plays, both for training and employment. And so the group that graduated recently with grounds and landscape um, maintenance got their bushwalker or hedge trimmer. Those who were trained in facilities maintenance got their toolkit. So those who are not employed yet can go out and find employment. I was telling the groups with the hedge trimmer and the um, weed walker to go and walk through Havendale. Every sidewalk is overgrown. So if those who really want to find work, they can find work. Right now, I'm putting a gang together because I have so much work in my grounds and landscape business that I can keep them fully employed. Right on, let the rain fall, Mr. Bennett, your people have employment. Um, manpower, our center, we call it a place for opportunities because as you see, we train, we hire, and we place. So the partnership with um, JSF, I hope it goes on for a very long time. We are very happy to participate. And the stories that we get from the people who we train, the testimonials and what have you, leave us in tears all the time. So thanks to JSF and hope it, um, the partnership continues. Everyone, we know that community development is important. We have heard many things today that point us in that direction. The one thing we have to know is that in terms of working together, again, to ensure that these communities are empowered to seek their own remedies to their problems, that's the job of us all in here today. Where we're glad to share some of our best practices with you that we've learned over 20 years and we hope that you can integrate what you've seen today into your next practices. Joseph is always free and open to questions. We have always had a approach where we are willing to work with partners and thank you for your time but we are also going to have a question and answer session. If there were any questions on any of the presentations today just a show of hands. Okay, no questions. That means all the presentations were well accepted. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. Let's try that again. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon again. As a woman of my word, what did I promise? Surprise. Prizes and surprises, correct? And as we have completed the penultimate um, group, I do have prizes, but you know, so we can't just give her the prize, I'm just so right. Mm -hmm. We have to have questions. So since the question and answer period, no one took them up on that offer. Here I am with two questions of my own. And if anyone can answer both questions, so is not, one, is not one answer going to win the prize? At first, it was going to be one answer, no, but then I saw the bag. 
So I thought that they were going to just give me a prize. But what they have given me is a gift bag with more than one thing. And you know how that go, right? We have to ask questions as a result. So here we go. I'm going to ask one easy question and one where I have to think about. But both questions have been answered today. So someone at some point already said what the answer is. Let me first say, even though the Betting, Gaming and Lotteries Commission, not among us, there are some persons who clearly would be disqualified. So if you work at JSAFE, all if you're not in the shirt today, you can't come answer the question. Agreed? All right. So my first question, my two questions. Number one, who is the managing director of JSAFE? No, do not bail out the answer. And number two, who is the chairman of JSIF? Do not tap the people them at JSIF on them shoulder and answer the question. Come now, come on. Marlene, Marlene, make the people them at home. Come, 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 tell me. The answers are on the Hi, page. so number one is Omar Sweeney, and the second person is Wayne Henry. Where you work, ma'am? FHI 360. Okay. <laughs> Hold on, don't come off of the stage. Thank you so much. So indeed, we have, yes, the chairman is Mr. Wayne Henry and the managing director is Mr. Omar Sweeney. All right. I'm going to turn it up a little bit more. We're going to turn it up a little bit more. Let's turn it up. Name three communities in Kingston that currently have environmental wardens. Whoa. No ball out the answer. Come with it. Come with it. Come, come hither. I know because she's slim, she can't move fast. I know you could have reached up your fast. Anna Town, then I'm Town and Tivoli. Hold on. Yes. Three communities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. She just rolled them off. <laughs> one last one. Oh, we're going to save the last one. So, see, woman of my word, I still have one more, but we are going to wait because any homie give away the whole of them now, you know. Then people start line up for the door. No, we have to bribe you off with something. So at this time, we are going to get ready for the final presentation of the afternoon. Is the sharing up going on at the table? The final presentation of the afternoon regarding safety and security. The topic, of course, is community-focused approaches to reducing crime and violence. And we invite the moderator, Ms. Antoinette Richards, community development specialist at the PIOJ to come to the podium. This one looks quite interesting. Not that all the others have not been interesting, but I have not seen any other with the title, Lord, my sister. So this promises to be a riveting conversation. Please welcome Miss Antoinette Richards and her team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I know normally we say we save the best for last, but I don't know if we can say best for last when we're going to talk about crime and violence. But what I would instead want to say is that when we fail in all the other areas that we have discussed earlier today, what we're about to discuss now is the result. And when we think about a sector that consume so much of our, of, of our, the country's finances on an annual basis, then it's something that we have to take seriously. Because when we think about the budget for the Ministry of National Security, which is over $60 billion, we think about the cost of violence-related injuries in the Ministry of Health, we think about loss of manpower hours when there is incidents of crime and violence in the community and persons are not able 
to go to work, we think about the impact on our education sector, when we think about the investments lost by the country as a result of crime. This is a very important topic, and I'm glad that you've all chosen to stay back with me, because I know there are many other things you could be doing at this moment. But before we get into the presentations, I would like to invite Ms. Renee Carr to do Lord, Ms. Sister. Lord, my sister. <laughs> Lord, my sister. Why, my sister? Mommy said I go to shop for go buy get a special now. Nah, no, she can't come back and nah, I know. She can't come back. Lord, my sister. Why, my sister? Mommy said I go to shop for go buy get a special now. Nah, no, she can't come back and nah, I know. She can't come back. Lady, you see my sister. Mr. Sir, you see my sister. Look a girl, you see my sister. Punzi, you see my sister. Mommy send her go a shop we go buy get a special no nah, no. She can't come back and nah, no. She can't come back. Lord, my sister. Why, my sister? Mommy send her go a shop we go buy get a special no nah, no. She can't come back. Me up on me yard and me ear a gada for me a wonder if a she get shot. Me say me up on me yard and me ear a gada for me a wonder if a she get shot. Why, my sister? Lord, my sister. Mommy say I go a shop for go buy get a special no nah, no. She can't come back and nah, I no. She can't come back. Me this. You see my sister? Me this, you see my sister? Mommy send her a shop to come by, get a special now, nah, no. She can't come back and nah, I no. She can't come back. Me this, you see my sister? Me this, you see my sister? Mommy send her a shop to come by, get a special now, nah, no. She can't come back. We in at the shop and we hear a god of how we look. I your sister that flat. We say we in at the shop and we hear a god of how you look. I your sister that flat. Why? My sister. Lord. My sister. Mommy send her go a shop to come by. Get a special now. Nah, no. She can't come back. Now. Nah, no. She can't come back. Look there. At the burial that see there, at the indigo that Why, my sister? Lord, my sister. Mommy send her go a shop to come by, get a special now. Nah, no, she can't come back. Unfortunately, the sentiments just expressed by Ms. Carr is a reality in too many of our communities. And so this is why forums of this nature is so critical for our country. I would now like to invite to join me at the podium my panelists. So Dr. Moncrief, please let her feel welcome as she's coming up. <laughs> Ms. Allen from PMI, Dr. Burke, from the UWI. Our fourth panelist, because we are so into technology, our fourth panelist will be joining us via Skype. <laughs> and that will be SSP McGregor. Okay. okay, so now we will get started with our first presentation and I would like to invite Dr. Moncrief to come forward. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me.
just waiting on the presentation. Can't find it? All right. I'll just do it for you. All right. Um, as my presentation cannot be located, I'm just going to use my computer. So sorry about that. Um, in February of this year, I completed a study for the Ministry of National Security. And the study was looking at the laws, the legislations, the Criminal Justice Suppression of Organizations Act and the Law Reform Act, which is the Lottery Scam Law. And the idea was to assess the extent to which those laws have had effect within, especially within Western Jamaica. What effect have the laws had? So I will not be going into the dynamics of the law. I won't be doing the technical aspect. What I wanted to focus on was understanding the underbelly of lawlessness. Because a part of the study, a significant part of it, was focused on speaking to the actors themselves and working within the communities just to see how do people think. The importance of that was that many times we have formal legislations or formal norms and we assume that they will work and it's really the informal norms that dictate what will actually happen. So as practitioners in the field, we need to know what's going on. And then we need to assess to what extent we are responsive to these. So let's start. Um, I started first, well, I didn't really start first with the police, but the first quote is from the police, where the police basically said, police cannot rectify social dislocation in Jamaica. The police have been given a basket to carry water. And it's the community that these persons are growing up in. When a child is growing up, and they hear gunshots and see youngsters getting away with killing someone, what else do we expect? Socialization has a lot to do with it in some places. I spoke to a PMI representative of Violence Interrupter who explained the context within which he grew up. He said to me that many were bred into these circumstances. So if they live in the community, they may not get breakfast. They have to find it. They may say, let me go find a coconut on Mr. John's place and then they just take it. So Mr. John might say, why didn't you ask me? But it's not a big issue. So they may say, let's pick up bottles from a certain place, but they don't see it as stealing. We might see it as stealing. You might see it as stealing. They see it as hustling. They have not grown up in black and white, right and wrong. And here we have a first set of norms that you have to consider, that many times when we have legislations and we say, this is right and this is wrong, it does not mean the same thing on the ground. Then I spoke to, I went into quite a number of communities. This is a result, well, I spoke to one young man and he was a deportee. He said to me, Jamaica is tense, we're in a hole. Because of the violence that surrounds the entire island, it makes us more tense. We go to work, we don't get the right amount and they're just taking step. I just don't have a chip on my shoulder. I have a whole block. We are angry, so any little thing, I'm likely to blow off. I'm just a mind in the field. If you step on our toes the wrong way, you have to say sorry. And if, even if you say sorry, it might be a knife in your throat. He then explained to me that Gent James is a hostile country. And I said, country? And he said, yes. We are a country, and we hold the bell for the most crime. And it's just life. There's nothing to look forward to. The whole of Jamaica is a garrison. I think it's important when we listen to presentations such as these that we refrain from being judgmental because it is actually true that the whole of Jamaica is a garrison. And the more we have our policies that are based in conditions of inequality, the more we imprison ourselves and imprison others. One young man explained to me he was actually one of the head scammers. He says, me no dot you up yet, but me can dot you up. Me no want no violence, me life stress. 
In every ghetto that you find, you always find some people who aren't true. Try and kill me and don't kill me and see what happens. Now, on the road, many people disregard legislations. And before we again pass a judgment, across all of the Jamaican society, many people disregard legislations. Some of us have experienced hard life, they explained. It's when you're young, you have no mother and father, you see what people are doing on the streets, and so you take it up as a habit. In Jamaica, we don't have set rules on what to do. People do not listen to the police because of how they flex. If you go to England and you hurt an animal, you get locked up. But here it doesn't matter. So the rules in England are more respected. I, ex I asked them to explain to me the rules of the road. They said we have many different types of rules that cause violence. Most people feel they should own a gun. And once you own a gun, it causes problems. One person explained to me, and this is somebody who was who has long been involved in one of our intervention programs. He says, if somebody kills my mother, I would have no guilt killing him. One of the scammers said to me, if a scammer is scammed, then that person should be killed. Dishonest people should be killed. <laughs> so, the critical thing here is that intragroup ethics, however these are defined, are paramount. They are much more important than state legislations, informal norms, intragroup ethics. On the road, even the most minor actions count as disrespect with severe consequences. In Mobay, the parties non-stop, someone told me. Crime can't stop, but it can lessen. It can't stop because everybody has access to a gun, and the least thing said to you, you kill for disrespect. If you pull the gun and don't kill, they will come back for you. Just wanted to point out on this issue of disrespect that it's not a Jamaica-specific phenomenon. I mean, I just finished some field work in another country, and it was much the same, where people saw not only day-to-day -day issues as disrespect, but the entire system where they are denied opportunities as totally disrespectful and therefore as authorization for violence. So it's easier to point a gun on someone than to chop up with a machete, which is why they have explained that you have more murders by gun than by a machete. But they all agreed everything is punishable by death. And then, of course, there are persons who explain to me that music and movies have substantial influence on how youth on the road act, and it influences their capacity to reason. Murder, they say, is a rite of passage. Many youth believe they're in a war against the state, and I'm going to come back to, you, to that shortly. For youth on the road, they told me, the church has little influence on shaping the values and on influencing actions. And so scamming is normalized in many communities. Okay, what do they mean by murder as a rites of passage? Friends, they tell me, influence friends to make a doppy. And when he make him first doppy, he wants to continue making a doppy. One person explained, me born and suffer real suffering. Me not tell us I never kill nobody yet. I have, but I never got used to it. Killing is easy. But getting used to it is a bit harder. And then he told me about his first murder, that he did it for a friend. But when he did it, he said, I didn't know what I did. And I wondered, what did you do? And then he vomited. And then he said, from my vomited, the braveness came back in me, and I wanted to do it again and again. And then there are distinctions across murders. So someone explained to me who the genuine murder, murderer is. Mommy, me shoot up a house and see a baby run out. I couldn't kill the baby. I had to stop a man from shooting up a house with babies, but plenty of people can do it. Therefore, there are gradations in murders. For youth on the road, as I said, the church has little influence on shaping values and influence in actions. 
In 2012, when I did the youth situation analysis, I pointed out then to the Ministry of Youth and Culture that the occult has substantial influence on young people, that many of the scammers then were involved in the occult. They would go to the Oberman for their baths, for their protection. At that time, when I did the research, it cost $150,000 to get a good guard ring. It now cost half a million dollars. When I did the research then, it was not just scammers who were involved. I went to one of our women's programs, and the girls explained to me that they regularly go to get their covering. They don't do it when they're pregnant, they tell me, because they see to the front, the baby sees to the back, so they are protected then. But as soon as that baby is born, they go and they load up the rings and the handkerchiefs, the teddy bears, with the spirits, and the spirits would burn whenever they are threatened. I wanted to explain to you, because it is easy to pass it off as a figment. I want to explain to you two things that are happening in this country. One is that the mixture of spirits, of the occult, with violence, is bringing a new spate of murders, a different type of slaughter that we should not ignore or underestimate. It propels people to do things that they would not normally want to do or sometimes even know that they are doing. And um, we ignore the spirits at our peril. Okay, so their reasoning is that I am more righteous than most people who go to church. Some people think that God cannot provide immediate protection, so it's best to go to the obey man who can provide solutions when the person wants it. In one rural community, the comment was, to me, the church is having a rest, them tired. There's a turn to the mystic and mysticism because Christian practice has lost value. And here again, we have to be candid that many of our churches have left really open doors. And so you would have them telling me that D. Lawrence is the real thing. They tell me where they go to get. Some people even travel abroad. And it happens across our social classes. It is important that we do not see this as a lower class phenomenon. But that we do understand that things well tie up from the top to the bottom. And so they, would, they, they, they tell me the types of obia that work, D. Lawrence importing from the United States or whatever, wherever they get that from, but that the local ones don't work as well. If you go to a local obia man in Westmoreland, they tell me their rings can burn, can, can bore, and so they're not as effective. But they tell me about the influence of the Indian mystics who are now in the country. And... Um, and therefore, for all people who think, please think. And for all people who pray, please pray. Many youth believe they're in a war against the state. I'm going to read something to you because it's not just the youth. Young people said to me, police are terrible. Even women with big belly, they treat like dog. We have to war them for our lives and safety because they are warring us. But I wanted to read something else for you. And this is from a rural community. I said to them, why are you this upset about the police? They said, police, let me touch the police. The police station should be removed from this community. They don't work for the pay here. And they told me about the police. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. They said, cartel not getting bail and he should be out here. Police like sweetie, give them five grand and they overlook things. They are summer robbers and they went into telling me about the police. Pure bad man going to the force. The police that go in now are about 21 or 22, and they have nothing to do with this country's development. And so after complaining, I said to them, so you have gunmen who kill, yet the citizens want to take up arms against the police. Why is that? 
we prefer gunmen to the police. We trust the gunmen by far over the police. The police wickeder than the gunmen. The gunmen not corrupt. He just kills who messes with him. The police are corrupt. And we call it money to kill a youth. He's licensed to kill. So we'll do so under the guise of the police. They give us no reason whatsoever to trust them. The rules of the road. Right. So another rule of the road. In Jamaica, we don't like to see friends suffer, but we don't like to see friends prosper either. If a man help you, they are the very ones who turn around and mess up your life. If they bring you and you start making more money, then what happens next? If you don't say, so what me do you accommodate, them start to pre for kill you because them say, them bring you and you bite the hand will feed you. Notice it didn't say in a particular section. It's in Jamaica, the rules of the road. The scammers, have, they have basically normalized the illegality and it, it is not just located there. I wanted you to understand that scamming includes persons who work in government. It includes, it includes our remittance agents. It includes customs. So when we are thinking about solutions, we have to think broader than we normally think. But for the scammers, they really can't understand why we have this uproar about it. We didn't go and take the money out of anyone's pocket. That's not robbery. We just use our brains and talk. It's what everyone is doing. No, the people on the other line should have sense. They have no sense. Imagine we're telling them to send money to Jamaica and they actually write the check and send it. They have no sense. White people are greater than we are and they gamble. No, they don't question how they got the $1.5 million winning. They know they do business with certain companies and that when you gamble, you leave your name and other details. But how is it logical to send such money to get money? Seriously? Seriously. And then they said, you know, government says they'll open up businesses and offer jobs, but this won't stop crime because what, offer per, what can you offer to somebody who's making $100,000 a minute? Man will see no reason to take up himself and go to work and wait for one month for money when he can dial and get money straight away. Then they told me about the benefits of scamming. Now, in 2012, I was told about the benefits of scamming, and it was like this. I was told that, don't you realize that because we scam, there are less rapes? That is because we don't have to go after women anymore. It's a good thing. Well, they told me about the benefits of scamming. They said, listen, a good scammer, as they make the money, they put it right back. They buy a car, they build a house, and so on. About 90% of people scam. People are living good because of illegal activities. It's called white crime in America, so it's nothing different. Scamming cannot stop. A new scammer is born every day. Just leave us alone and protect us. I'll also use the funds to build up the country. They should really call us and tell us how to, let us tell them how to get the business done. And they said, please tell the police that they should protect us from the bad man and then let us help the government to do what the government needs to do. And I wanted to just point out here that, and it's something I've pointed out in other fora, that I remember doing some work with some youth who had been sent to JFLL and they were told that they could not do math, but they were very good at it on the streets. It's an indictment on our education system that so many clever people have been let loose and not contribute to this country. And they pointed out that you have criminal activity at all levels, but people only see the ghetto. They don't see the politicians' crime. They don't see the bank's crime. That is how they see it. I have just one minute left, and so I just wanted to, to quickly wrap up. I will not go into the challenges that I wanted to discuss. <laughs> All right, okay. Let me go back up. <laughs> um, and so they explained to me 
that with, among scammers, they know who is wise, who are the wise ones, who are the unwise ones. The unwise ones, they say, are those who just go pre-party, gun and weed. The wise ones are those who will take the money, buy a taxi, buy a few taxis. When it looks a bit hot, bring the money back in, and so on. Those are smart ones. Put different cars on different routes, and they actually believe that this is good for the economy, certainly good for their for their, for their communities where scammers are actually filling voids that should have been filled long ago. So that is how they perceive it. Scammers are clever. They are cognizant of the loopholes in the legislations and they change their tactics, right? So, and the norms are spreading into, <laughs> into the rural areas, right? Um, the level of enmeshment, as I said, poses a significant problem for law enforcement and there are budding links between lottery scamming and gang violence. It didn't start out that way, but that is what is happening now. And then, of course, the, the, the focus 